Coach Holder here. I recently wrote an article that you could find on CoachHelder.com pertaining to gas masks. And are they right for you? Uh, is it something that you should add to your survival kit or to your go bag? I can't make that decision for you. Only you can make that decision because you have the information about yourself that I don't. What I hope to do is just convey some points and hopefully some valid points that will help facilitate that decision for you. Now, what I'm using here is I'm using Bob as my demonstrator because it's a lot easier for me to convey the information with the visual being here as opposed to being on me. Uh, second of all, one of the points that we'll get into is having a beard and having a beard is uh, pretty much a no-go when it comes to having a proper seal or a proper fit on a mask. But we'll get into that. That'll be one of the points that we'll be discussing in this video. So hopefully with this video, I'll be able to bring the points across that I wrote in the article, giving you some extra visuals so that uh, hopefully I can convey the information and you can decide if a gas mask is right for you. Now, I want you to keep in mind that uh, this isn't the movies. So you can't just put on your gas mask and be protected against everything that's out there, whether it's nuclear, biological, chemical, radiological, so on and so forth. Now, it'll protect you great against tear gases and things like that, which is really my focal point of being able to operate in certain conditions, certain conditions especially with what's going on in the world. But when it comes to other gases like sarin gas uh, that we see on the news being util utilized, unfortunately, in parts of the world, you'll be able to protect your lungs and, let's say, your eyes against it, but anything else that you have exposed, stuff's going to still be able to contaminate you uh, because you're not breathing it in, but it's still landing on your skin. Uh, when it comes to something like anthrax, you can be exposed to it for, for weeks and not even know that you were exposed to it. So once again, unless you're wearing a full suit and a gas mask 24-7, uh, you're not going to bow too well in those type of situations. So let's be aware of what is practical and what the limitations are for a gas mask. And if you're aware of that and know what those points are, uh, you'll be able to make a better judgment as to whether or not uh, adding a gas mask to your survival kit is uh, the right choice for you. So let's go ahead and get started with uh, some of the points that I want to bring to your attention. One of the first points that I want to bring across is the actual fit of the gas mask. As I mentioned earlier, I have a beard. So once again, this is an MSA Millennium that I'm using here as far as the gas mask for this demonstration. And uh, the manufacturer themselves, MSA, state that you're good to go pretty much with half an inch of facial hair or less. Uh, and that's theirs. Other manufacturers have actual uh, more stringent um, specifications when it comes to facial hair. So once again, the seal that's being formed here, if that's broken, if that's not fastened well, the gas or the contaminants are still going to enter into here and basically you're going to have your own little self-contained gas chamber uh, which isn't going to work too well for you. So you can tell here there's all these little straps that are easy to loosen up and easy to tighten. So once the, the gas mask is done on there, you want to make sure that you adjust these straps get that good seal in there so that you're good to go. Once again, uh, this particular gas mask is issued to a lot of the SWAT teams in our area as far as the New Jersey and New York City area. And uh, these operators get fitted twice a year. So that kind of tells you something. If they're investing that kind of time and money just to get fitted onto, uh, on their gas mask, then there's obviously something to this fit and something that you really need to think about. Uh, there is no one size fits all. There isn't going to the surplus store, picking up a mask for a good price, and now you're good to go. Uh, if you do that, it's going to be a false sense of security, and that's one of the points that I'm trying to avoid or um, bring to your attention with this video. Uh, so, uh, you know, just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing is gas masks really do not fill, fit well on children. All right, so uh, there's a few of them out there, a few companies that state that they manufacture them for children, so on and so forth. I did a little bit of research and uh, they, I, I wouldn't trust them. All right, so when it comes to children, comes to beards, something that you definitely want to keep in mind. You want to get this right fit. You want to get it fit to you or to any other members of your family that you're going to be trying to provide a gas mask for. Another point to keep in mind here is hydration. Uh, think about it you're going to be operating in an environment where your heart is probably beating through your chest because you're in a crisis or you're in, in, in an emergency. On top of it, you're going to be performing work, whether it's just hiking around or walking around with your bag, uh, with your go bag, with your kit, whatever the case may be, 
or trying to accomplish the mission, whether it's getting back to your family, whether it's getting your family to safety, who knows what the case may be. Regardless, you're going to be performing work, which is also going to add to dehydration. On top of it, you're breathing through this heavy filter, so you're going to have labored breathing. Once again, another contributor to dehydration. So you're going to want to make sure that you're able to get hydrated while you're operating with this mask on. Uh, the good thing is this particular unit and a lot of the, uh, the other ones that are out there, especially more higher end uh, units, come with this little hose, okay? With this hose, now you, there's uh, various water containers, uh, one of them being this uh, military-issued canteen, uh, one that I was issued years ago, and has this little reservoir, this little spout here, where this hose is able to be attached. So we can go ahead, squeeze that in there, we're good to go. Inside of this mask here is another little hose, very similar to hydration packs. Uh, when you utilize those hose and you kind of bite down on them and you're able to uh, suck your water down, pretty much a very similar com uh, concept uh, when it comes to utilizing your gas mask, especially this particular one. Uh, so keep that in mind. You want to be able to address your hydration needs because once this mask is on and you're in a contaminated environment, if you take it off, you're going to expose yourself right to uh, what you didn't want to be exposed to to begin with when you put the mask on. Another point I want to bring up is comms, right, or communications. With, uh, when it comes to, let's say, speaking on your radio, whether it's a ham radio, two-way radio, just trying to communicate with your family or whatever group you're working with to get through this crisis, once it's uh, relatively difficult to understand any audio that's coming out of this mask. Uh, once again, imagine in an environment where there's a crisis going on, noise all over the place, uh, it's going to be that much more difficult. And with, uh, with these masks, what they have is they have an amplifier here that's uh, fairly simple, a couple AA batteries, testing, testing, they just kind of click right testing, onto the front testing, of the mask, one, two, enabling two. you to amplify all the sounds testing, that are coming testing, out of your mask. Testing, so testing, you are communicating two. over a radio testing, testing, or just one, verbally, um, you're good to go because of this amplification. Now, keep in mind that these are pricey. Uh, some of these are half the cost of the mask, and these masks aren't cheap to begin with. Uh, but once again, I'm just trying to show you uh, different uh, features or different applications that you do want to think about so that you don't end up with some type of false sense of security. It's better to know and know what your limitations are than to be out there in an emergency and find out the hard way. Another point to take in consideration is where are you going to stage your mask? That's super important because if you don't get to it and get to it in time, then it's way too late. So a lot of people recommend to have multiple masks near your go bags, near wherever your base camp might be, whether you're planning on bugging out, whether you're planning on bugging in. But as I stated earlier, these gas masks are super expensive. So for me, that's not an option. So I want to be able to have my wherewithal about me and say, okay, well, listen, I'm either going to attach it to the outside of my go bag, my main go bag that I know that's with me all the time. And if I'm in an area where I know that there might be an imminent attack uh, about to happen because we were lucky enough to get warmed, the, uh, the other option is these type of carriers. And you see uh, police officers and military. This one happens to be made by Blackhawk. It basically will attach to any rig, whether it's your Molly system, whether it's your belt on your waist, whether it's strapped uh, around your leg. And uh, once again, just, uh, just a container to be able to access and reach in there and get your, uh, your mask fast and efficiently. And you're able to store excess filters in here. You're able to also uh, store your extra batteries if you do have uh, an amplifier for your voice, things of that nature. All right. So being able to access it, being able to uh, get it on as fast as you could possibly get it on, that all is going to bode on whether you're going to get contaminated or not. So if you don't address this to begin with, it's relatively useless to even have the mask because it's really no good to you after the fact. Now, one of the main concerns that you want to have is your filter. There's uh, all sorts of uh, attacks that we could be uh, prone to, unfortunately, and I discussed it in the beginning of this video. And when you have a filter like this one that actually protects against CBRN, so chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear, right? So this is a relatively expensive filter. So there's all sorts of other filters out there that might just protect against CS gas or uh, other types of tear gases. So you want to keep that in mind. Without a proper filter, your mask is completely useless. And even then, when you have a high-speed filter like this, if you're not in a full suit 
and a lot of these chemical particles end up on other parts of your body, you're still going to end up contaminated. So once again, I know I'm repeating that again, but it is really something important because people think they can just buy a mask and they're good to go and they're protected against everything. And that's just a false sense of security. And, uh, you know, if I could help try and clear that up just a little bit with my uh, layperson knowledge, uh, then I'm going to go ahead and try and do that. All right. Because the last thing we want is any type of false security. So once again, thinking about what you're going to want to protect against. Also, keep in mind that as soon as these filters are open, you probably have about a six month uh, shelf life because they end up still getting contaminated with dust and everything else that's gonna end up clogging the filter in here. So make sure, I'm sure I probably did, wrote a date on when I opened it up, 416. So that way I pretty much know that I have six months from that date to be able to uh, utilize this filter effectively. So they come in sealed bags. Once they're opened up, you're basically uh, running on borrowed time. Now, one of the last thoughts that I want to leave you with, and probably one of the most vital, is training. Being able to put your mask on effectively, fast, quickly. Being able to operate with your mask on. I suggest if you're sitting around watching TV for a half hour, put your mask on. There's a good uh, number, I think it's like 2 or 3% of the population that's claustrophobic. So you might be one of those people, or somebody in your family might be one of those people. And the last, last time... Uh, you want to find that as quick as possible. You don't want to find that out during the actual emergency. So by donning your mask, getting super familiar with it, keeping it in your container, being able to access it out of your container, how you place it in the container is going to bode well. Your strap should be loose so that that way when you do put it on right away, you're able to start breathing right away, even just holding it to your face. And then from there, you could go ahead with your other hand and start adjusting the straps. So keep those straps loose. Keep this uh, mask inside of your bag so that when you do pull it out of your bag, it's pretty much ready to go, not all tangled up. And the only way that that's really going to get ingrained in you is by constant practice, just like any other tool that we hope to utilize for survival or emergency preparedness. So this is no different. And since there's so much going on and not something that we usually, most of us, walk around and operate with masks on often, it's something that you really need to hammer in and hammer in as often as possible. So training is everything. Train with it on with your firearms, with different uh, self-defense tools, whether it are blades, whether they're retractable batons, utilize that, get used to breathing with it on so that there are no surprises because there's going to be enough surprises during an emergency situation, right? The last thing that you want to do is leave out other factors that you could actually handle and address now training being super imperative. So keep that in mind. So once again, this is Helder and Bob. I really hope that you uh, found this information useful.